Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 18 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's uh, lecture will be on some extended applications of 2D Photonic Crystals and we will also cover some applications of 3D Photonic Crystals. So, here is the lecture outline, we will first have some insight into Photonic Crystal Band Diagram, we will discuss about the dispersion relations in uh, details, we will discuss about ISO frequency contours and how those contours can be used you know, for engineering devices. So, that can be also termed as dispersion engineering and then we will try to design wave, wavelength filters and we will see some photonic crystal sensors okay, in this particular lecture. So, first we will look into as I mentioned, we will go into details of photonic band diagram mainly to understand how dispersion engineering can help us design different kind of devices, photonic devices. So, when you talk about dispersion, dispersion is very, is a general term for any situation where the electromagnetic property of a medium change. Okay? So, you can see the first figure shows chromatic dispersion. So, this occurs when material properties change with frequency. Okay? So, it leads to different refractive indices uh, for each wavelength of light and as you can see that is the reason why you know different wavelengths of light band differently and that is how you get this you know um, spectral separation when light comes out from a prism and you can uh, call this as chromatic dispersion right so this happens in prism you can also think of natural phenomena like you know rainbows okay where you see this kind of chromatic dispersion you can also have polarization dispersion and that happens in a anisotropic medium where electromagnetic wave experiences different material properties based on the polarization direction Okay, say you have uh, these two different po orthogonal polarization going in, but the refractive index along say this is x and this is y. So, along x and y are different, so they will be affected differently and this is what is called you know polarization dispersion and it is commonly discussed in uh, waveguide theory. Then other type of dispersion is also called uh, spatial dispersion. Okay, so it is related to space. Okay. So, as you can understand this arises when material properties vary with the direction of wave propagation. So, that means you know the wave traveling at different direction will have different speed and that is what is shown here um, schematically. Okay. So, it basically affects the timing and the wavelength of arriving pulses. So, these are the three basic types of dispersion. So, when we talk about dispersion relation, dispersion relation basically um, links the wave factor k to the frequency omega, right? And it quantifies the magnitude of the wave vector uh, as a function of direction, okay? And the refractive index that is uh, experienced by the wave based on its propagation direction. When we talk about refractive index, for a known frequency, the dispersion relation provides a measure of the refractive index. So, that basically illustrates that you know how um, you know how the refractive index varies with the direction of the wave inside a material. You can also consider you know in case of linear, homogeneous and isotropic material which are generally the ordinary materials we discuss. Okay? The refractive index is basically consistent in all directions. So, along x, y and z axis you can see that the refractive index is same. In that case, the dispersion relation that describes this particular material takes the form of a sphere in the k space and you can write it as k x square plus k y square plus k z square to be equal to k naught n whole square. So, the spherical uh, dispersion surface in this linear, homogeneous and uh, isotropic materials is basically um, analogous to the index ellipsoid that uh, we discussed in conventional crystalline optics, 
Okay. So, this basically describes the spatial dispersion characteristics of the material. Right. In anisotropic media, however, the dispersion takes a bit of complex form because the dispersion relations become complex which allows multiple dispersion surfaces uh, corresponding to different polarization. That means, wave traveling in the same direction may experience you know different kind of refractive indices based on their polarization. So, that makes things complicated is not it. You can also have biaxial material which actually have two optic axes. Okay, I believe you know the basics of this you know isotropic, uniaxial and uh, biaxial materials. We will we'll cover them briefly in this lecture as well. So, if you think of biaxial uh, materials, they basically have uh, a different refractive index in all uh, direction. Okay, so, they can be characterized by two optic axes. So, what, what that means, I will come to that okay in the next few slides so they also exhibit unique uh, dispersion surfaces uh, and that interact intersect at four points symmetrically around the origin okay and that is what makes it biaxial and you will get two optic axes over there okay so wave propagating along this optic axis uh, experience uniform refractive index across all polarization so they could mimic the behavior of isotropic material only for those optic axis case. Okay. Now, if you think of the dispersion relation for biaxial material which are characterized by two optic axis. So, you can think of um, the relation between wave vector and refractive index along the principal axis say a cap, b cap and c cap. Okay. Um, which encapsulates the anisotropic nature of the medium like this. Okay. So, you can see that N A and B and N C are basically the refractive indices along the three principal axes. Okay. And these are the corresponding uh, wave, wave vector okay, or you can say wave number. Okay. So, this is how the relation is. Okay. So, we can describe all these different uh, dispersion surfaces with uh, some example from by taking some examples of uh, simple uh, dispersion surfaces. So, first let us consider the dispersion surface of an isotropic medium. So, that you have already discussed said that here you know along k x, k y and k z you have the same uh, refractive indices. So, in all direction you have the same refractive indices. So, the dispersion surface basically looks like a sphere and we have seen that equation it is basically k x square plus k y square plus k z square will be equal to k naught n whole square right simple that is the uh, equation for a sphere. Now, when you consider that your n a and n b are equal, but it is not same as n c okay that those kind of materials are called uniaxial okay so here we are showing you two different types of uniaxial crystal right because here you can see that along x and y or you can say a and b okay uh, primary axis you can also some some papers or some books refer to them as you know uh, n x n y and n z that is also fine you can also write them as n a n b n c this is ok. So, what is important here is to note that n a and n b are equal but that is not same as n c ok that is along the z direction. So, this kind of material are called uniaxial and uh, if you put that into this particular generic equation which is basically for the biaxial ok if you put this n a equals n b okay and you take that as ordinary okay and you say nc is different so that is extraordinary you denote it as ne then this equation boils down to this particular equation clear so in a particular uniaxial crystal you will have two directions uh, or along which the refractive indices are same so you can call them as ordinary and uh, the third direction 
can be called as you know uh, extraordinary right so you can actually see uh, ordinary wave and extraordinary wave depending on the axis along which the waves are propagating inside this particular uh, crystal right now the dispersion relation that you see in this particular equation okay is basically in kept in such a form that it is easy for you to interpret right so you can see that it is basically a product of two dispersion surfaces right so this one is a sphere which is shown here right and then you have another one which is like a ellipsoid which is shown here right so having two dispersion surfaces at the same time actually produces interesting effect something like you know uh, double refraction which is best known for occurring in calcite crystals okay so the dispersion surfaces for an isotropic material and as you can see this is for the case of one uniaxial where your no the ordinary refractive index is smaller than any okay it is called a positive uniaxial crystal and there is also possibility of the other one where no is larger than any in that case you know you will have uh, no is this one and any is this uh, short one okay so in that case no is greater than any so that is called negative uniaxial crystal right so these are the two different types of uh, uniaxial materials shown in this figure okay so here it is very simple that the dispersion surface for this isotropic media is nothing but a sphere what is the radius of the sphere it is basically k not n or you can say k not n o because it is ordinary in all three directions so you can simply say um, k not n or k not n o that's fine okay now how about this one the uniaxial uh, media here you can see that one dispersion surface is basically a sphere what is the radius of this sphere it is k not n o okay and uh, that actually describes the refractive index for the ordinary wave okay which is traveling in either this direction or this direction however okay the second dispersion surface which is basically the extraordinary wave is for the wave that is traveling along this that direction right so in that case okay uh, it is basically an ellipsoid where you will have uh, you know the semi major axis and minor axis okay so the ma semi major axis is uh, k not any and semi minor axis is k not no right so that is how you can actually see the different um, uh, direction of the waves propagating through this particular uniaxial crystal will have different refractive index right so the refractive index of the extraordinary wave will fall somewhere in between no and any depending on the direction in which it is propagating right so for the case of uh, positive uniaxial media the ordinary refractive index is basically smaller than the extraordinary one so that we have seen it means the ellipsoid is basically elongated along so it's basically a uh, prolate shape like a capsule okay you can think of so everything is in k space okay so that you have to keep in mind this is in the momentum space right so it looks more like a egg or cucumber okay whereas you know the negative uniaxial crystal is where you know you have the ordinary refractive index larger than the extraordinary refractive index and that is the case when the ellipsoid is like compressed it's like a gems okay chocolate so it's like uh, oblate shape okay and uh, this is how it will look like so again here also depending on the direction of uh, propagation the wave may experience anything between no and any refractive index right now with that we'll go to some interesting features from the band diagram okay that will also tell us so this band diagram is nothing but you know telling us about uh, direction okay and the frequency okay or omega so it's, these are also like you know uh, dispersion surfaces okay 
So, what you actually see here is that for any 2D photonic crystal, if you think of the full band structure, if you remember the normal band structure, we have seen that we only try to plot it for the irreducible brilliant zone, isn't it? That actually uh, reduces the load on our computation, but actual band diagram looks like this. It is basically a 3D uh, because you have you know x and y. These are the two different um, uh, momentum vectors, beta x and beta y. Okay, and then the z axis is basically the normalized frequency. Okay, which is nothing by but a by lambda, isn't it? You can write it as omega a by 2 pi c naught, which boils down to a by lambda naught. Okay, what is a? A is basically the period of the of the photonic crystal. Okay, we assume that it's a 2D photonic crystal. Okay, and then what is lambda naught? That is the frequency in vacuum. Okay, of the light at which you want your photonic crystal to perform or work. Okay, so let us first see that what are these isofrequency contours. Now, isofrequency contours are basically dispersion surfaces or in periodic structures. Okay, so they are basically telling you that these are the wave vectors relations relationship at constant frequency. Okay, so this is a um, this is the 3D diagram of the first order band. Now, if you try to take the cross section for a particular same frequency, so say a frequency 0 0.05, you take a slice, then 0 0.02, you take a slice. How the slice of 0 0.02 look like if the band structure is conical? You will cut and you will see that you are basically getting a circle. Same at 0 0.05, you get a smaller circle. Right? So, what is same in this particular relation or in this particular circle is that the frequency is same because you have obtained it at the same frequency level. So, that this is why these are called isofrequency when same frequency contours. Same at 0 0.35 you will get this blue circle and if you go high you actually you know come out of this cone. So, when you have 0 0.5 you are basically getting uh, cross section of these four extended legs and this is what you see that is for 0 0.5. So, this is corresponding to um, okay, the first band structure. So, what is important here to notice that this, this isofrequency contours are very much unique in shape. In periodic structures you know isofrequency contours often have non ellipsoidal shape and that leads to very unique propagation you know properties. So, you can also you know try to think of you know what happens for higher order band something like second order band. So, in 3D the second order band looks like this and same if you take you know slices at different fixed frequencies say this one the first one 0 0.75 it will look more or less like a square. If you go below slightly at 0 0.69, you will see this kind of a shape, little curvy, but then it is also having those, say it is kind of a uh, square pattern with little curves. Okay? Then if you go further, you can actually get this kind of shape. Now, why these things are important? Okay? That we will see that you can actually de design a lot of devices when you explore this kind of features dispersion relation right isofrequency contours can be used in predicting phase and power so you can actually um, look into the direction of the phase vector and also the power vector propagation so if it is a uh, circle it's very very simple because in that case the block wave vector will connect to the uh, origin of the brilliant zone that is the center and that direction actually marks the direction of you know phase propagation. However, for the power vector or you can say the power uh, propagation direction or you can say the pointing vector, uh, 
you need to actually draw a perpendicular to that particular chosen point at the uh, isofrequency contour that is IFC. Now, in the case of you know different types of isofrequency contour, how this makes a lot of difference that if you are having a circular IFC that will result in your phase vector and propagation vector propagating in the same direction right but if you have this kind of you know non circular shapes something like almost square shape or this kind of a pin cushion kind of shape okay in that case so the wave vector or you know you can say the block wave vector can be simply say at this point you connect it to the center of the brilliant zone and this vector is your block wave vector but however the pointing vector it has to be normal at this particular point and that goes like this so it diverges from the direction of the beam propagation isn't it so you can actually utilize this particular feature to understand couple of interesting features and devices okay the first one could be to achieve negative refraction without negative refractive index so the dispersion offered by uh, photonic structures can be used in other ways okay so now let us look into the devices that can be designed based on dispersion engineering so the first example would be to think of you know negative refraction without negative refractive index how is that possible so the figure over here actually help us understand how dispersion engineering can be done okay so the dispersion offered by periodic structure can be used in different other ways okay and many of these use cases can be understood through the simple concept of phase matching so let us take a very simple example which is the routine uh, refraction right so let us try to understand the you know refraction using the concept of you know phase matching so look into the first figure here which shows the phase matching between air and some kind of uh, medium okay so both medium are isotropic and they have isofrequency contours which look like circles right now here you can see that the material 2 has a larger circle it means it has got a larger uh, refractive index as compared to uh, the first medium so we can take this as air and this can be any dielectric now what happens this is the direction of the wave vector okay so if you draw a normal you can also see what is the direction of the power flow you try to get the component of this wave vector which is along the surface okay so you can take it as kt that is the tangential component of the wave vector k and the same will be continuous across the interface okay so you put it over here and then if you try to find out the intersection of this one with this isofrequency contour you see you actually in come to this point now you join this point and this point and you see that the wave vector actually has bent ideally it was going this like like this in this particular direction it has now bent this way from here if you try to plot a normal that will give you the pointing vector direction so it tells you about the power flow direction in the case of refraction clear so imagine if you go for denser to rarer medium you will have the opposite scenario say this is now the isofrequency contour and in the, that case you will have a smaller isofrequency contour here okay and you will see that this component will then hit at much up higher position in the isofrequency contour 2 and you will say see that this is basically deviating much farther away from the normal and that is what happens when the light incident from a denser to a rarer medium so using this concept you can very well explain the concept of refraction isn't it amazing so here also you can see that you know the power flow and the wave flow wave vector they are in the same direction right so that is 
the case of refraction of a beam from air into dielectric. Now, okay, these are the things mentioned here. So, now look at the case over here. Now, imagine that you have the, the first material is same, you have air, okay, but the second me medium is now not a normal dielectric, you replace this by a photonic crystal, okay, which has isofrequency contour of this at that particular uh, wavelength, okay. So, how do you choose that? You can go and you know look for this kind of a you know um, pattern, okay. So, you know what frequency or what normalized frequency this will be achieved. Normalized frequency is nothing but A over lambda naught. Lambda naught you know the operating frequency or the wave, wave number that is incident on your system. From that you can find out what is the A that is the lattice period required that can give you this kind of a isofrequency contour. So, if you have something like this as your material tube, so this part remains same. Again, you try to you know match this uh, tangential component of the wave vector kt here. You come over here, but then well, if you try to find out the power flow direction, you will see that the power flows along the normal. So the wave goes in this direction, but the power will be along this direction. So this is how you know the overall thing will look like. Okay, so you are basically having, um, you know, the refraction of a beam into a negative refractive uh, periodic structure. So this looks like, you know, negative refraction, isn't it? So you can actually achieve uh, negative refraction without negative refractive index. Fine. So these are some interesting features that can be obtained by using you know photonic crystal uh, of particular uh, dimensions and that is why those band diagrams and isofrequency contours are so important because all the frequencies in the isofrequency con contour are normalized ones so they are basically a by lambda naught okay so if you fix that you are you want to work uh, for the telecom wavelength that is lambda naught is 1.55 micrometer, you can immediately find out what should be A, the lattice spacing to design that particular photonic crystal. The next important feature is called self collimation. So, self collimation is a property of some periodic structures where the beam appears to remain collimated that is parallel, okay, indefinitely, almost independently of the source beam. So, normally with the lens, a beam will become convergent, but if you, you know, put a collimated beam like this, okay, so this is the self collimated uh, photonic crystal, you can see the convergent beam can actually, you know, uh, propagate uh, parallelly in that particular crystal. So, how do you do that? Okay, again IFC, isofrequency contour analysis can help you. Lattices designed for self collimation are analyzed using their isofrequency contours, which guide both phase and power propagation directions. So, in case of linear homogeneous and isotropic materials, we have seen IFCs are uh, spherical. Okay, that means your phase and power propagates in the same direction. But what do you want? You want self collimation. That means you want somewhere you know your direction of power should be parallel, independent of the direction of the wave. Okay, propagation like this. It means you actually want a periodic structure which gives you a isofrequency contour which is flat okay so that allows self collimation so here you can think of uh, you know a cone of wave vectors something like that but then when the power actually you can find out the pointing vector in each case you will see that that is 
parallel. So that way you can prevent the beam from divergence and it, it has got many applications. Okay? So this is how a diverging beam in air can become self collimated beam inside the lattice. Okay? So if you take this particular example, so the isofrequency contour is 0 0.73. So if you choose uh, a lattice spacing which is a by lambda naught equals 0 0.73 or you can say a equals 0 0.73 lambda naught, you can actually achieve self collimation at the free space wavelength of lambda naught. Right? It means you can actually see the beam staying collimated as long as it travels along the axis okay like this so this is what the simulation shows so what kind of lattices give us so you can think of uh, typical um, uh, 2d lattices like this which is basically a whole array okay or you can think of the 3d lattice which will have a 3d uh, isofrequency contour okay so here you can see it has got a flat isofrequency contour so irrespective of the direction so any diverging beam you can say can become kind of you know collimated something similar happens in 3d as well right so as you understand that for identifying the condition for self collimation what is important you have to look for a isofrequency contour which is basically flat okay and further it has to be designed to identify a band isolated from other bands so that there is no coupling to other modes okay so if you take this kind of a air hole array here the substrate is basically epsilon 2 equals 9 and this is uh, epsilon 1 equals 1 so that this is air hole and the fill factor is 40 percent so for that case this is how the you know isofrequency contours look like what are these numbers these numbers are basically a by lambda naught okay so we could find the almost uh, you know um, flat response here when it is a by lambda naught is equal to 0 0.332 that is also the your normalized frequency right so with that you can actually find out what is the fractional bandwidth so you can identify the two points okay like this so this is called beta x1 and this is beta x2 okay so you know these two values omega at beta x1 and omega at beta x2 with that you can find out what is the fractional bandwidth of this self collimation okay so between this band it will remain um, you know self collimated you can also find out what is the inflection point that is uh, this particular point one one specific point okay you can also find out what is the normalized accept time angle using this formula you can find out the strength matrix overall figure of merit okay so these are the points okay uh, uh, for self collimation which are the figure of merits now as i mentioned what is this inflection point so it is called beta xi so it is identified as a point along the horizontal axis where the curvature of this uh, isofrequency contour surface is zero okay and yeah and what is this uh, la capital lambda x it is basically the lattice periodicity along x direction okay so that actually tells us how you can uh, define or design self collimator lens and different kind of other effects the next important application would be wavelength filtering so a high performance wavelength filter is very important in wavelength division multiplexing or you can say the high speed optical dense optical networks so photonic crystals are expected to provide a compact solution for such filters so there are three fundamental types of filters one is resonant type one is directional couplet type and the third one is diffraction type okay so these figures are actually shown here so 
A and B are basically showing you resonant filters with this one with parallel waveguides and this one with series waveguides. Okay. The third one is basically a uh, resonant filter uh, as you can see here it is coupled with uh, a resonant filter coupled with free space okay. and this one is a directional coupler based okay. and this one is a diffraction filter based on superprism effect. Okay. So, a point effect inside a photonic crystal can serve as a cavity right it is an extremely small cavity for oscillating light waves and it is important um, as resonant filter with large free spectral range ok. So, the actual free spectral range of a point defect cavity is limited by the width of the photonic band gap, but it can cover the optical uh, fiber communication ranges something like C band and L band ok. So, L band is from this. So, enhancing the quality factor to you know somewhere between 1000 to 100,000 allows a very high thinness of over 10,000. These are some you know characteristic qualities of the resonant filters that can be achieved using photonic crystals. So, research has explored the combination of point effects on slight or slightly larger defects than points ok with line defects as you can see here in uh, this A, B and C right. Now, what is important the tunability is important right tunability of the filter or the resonance frequency is important and it can be achieved by controlling the size of the defect. And although this will require you know precise control up to nanometer scale and that poses an important challenge towards fabrication of this kind of devices. And uh, post manufacturing processes something like trimming are deemed indispensable for achieving targeted resonance frequencies in practical devices. So, current research is basically focused on improving the quality factor and the efficiency of this kind of devices. In actual WDM system controlling the filter function is essential for achieving high spectral efficiency and tuning the shape of filters response would involve the design of uh, coupled defects which is a new significant future research area. Okay. So, the peculiar dispersion characteristics which is seen above a photonic band gap ok as you can see in this particular figure is used for the diffraction type of filter which is also called the super prism filter ok. So, in, in standard 1D diffraction grating wavelength dependent diffraction is achieved uh, through simple zone folding of the dispersion characteristics. If you go for higher dimensional photonic crystals they will exhibit more complex zone folding which we discussed briefly in the 2D and 3D case right. And that enhances the wavelength sensitivity and also the angular dispersion and altering the beam propagation right. So, the behavior is analyzed through the dispersion surface analysis again and you can draw you know contour plots of the band curves over the brilliant zone which are shown here right. So, for normal propagation you can see this kind of spherical you know dispersion surfaces. You can have uh, collimators like from dispersion surfaces like this ok. You can have prism kind of effect from dis dispersion surface like this ok where suddenly the normal will you know deviate in different direction. You can also have you know lengths which gives you converging beams ok from this dispersion surfaces. So, all these possibilities are there. So, light in a photonic crystal will uh, travel along the gradient of the dispersion surface resulting in a collimated you know beam like propagation and also you know lens like effect due to the sur surface convexity or you know uh, concavity. So, depending on how your surfaces 
R, you can actually make collimator, you can make you know prism effect or you can get lens effect, right? So, what is important to understand that these characteristics also exhibit strong wavelength dependence. So, they are significant, okay, for achieving strong angular dispersion. Now, if you think of filter application, these slight behaviors must be considered to accurately estimate the wavelength resolution, which is determined by the mappings in figure B. Okay, in the case of how to characterize this kind of filters, okay, you can see that the early research anticipated high resolution at abrupt dispersion changes, but uh, these regions uh, limit usable wavelengths and resolution points due to increased angular dispersion and beam divergence. So, what you see here, this, this first one shows beam collimation parameter 1 by p. The second one shows the wavelength sensitivity parameter that is q and the last this graph shows you the wavelength resolution parameter which is q by p. Okay? So, these are all calculated for 2D photonic crystal, this one also for 2D photonic crystal. right? So, as you can see the 2D photonic crystal is basically the most popularly used one because it is easy to fabricate. Okay, 3D ones are very complicated, 1D ones also have application but they are limited. Now, the better resolution conditions can be found slightly away from the abrupt change in the dispersion characteristics. Potentially, you know, they offer higher resolution parameters than the typical diffraction gratings. So, spatial separation of different uh, wavelength beams in a super prism would require a total length of the order of centimeters comparable to silica based array waveguide grating filters AWG filters if you have studied about you know integrated photonics or silicon photonics you will come across this kind of filters which are used for you know different wavelength can be diffracted into different direction and routed into different direction those kind of filters. So, the complexity of zone folding in super prism necessitates this length which is of the order of centimeter and this is in contrast to the normal grating okay, and AWGs where resolution improves with higher diffraction orders. So, the super prism effect primarily uses lower order bands something like second to fourth order which corresponds to lower order diffraction to avoid the complex overlaps and multi beam output which are typically seen for the higher order bands. So, you will see that you know the photonic crystal band uh, based super prism filters or diffraction filters they basically are based on this lower order diffractions. So, ongoing research is focused on reducing the size because right now it is of the order of centimeters. Uh, what is the other objective to enhance the resolution through structural modification and look for new principles of light beam separation. So, these are all active areas of research and uh, this is why I am discussing all these things here. Okay? The other type of filter is the polarization filter. You can think of photonic crystals which feature numerous boundaries with high refractive index contrast that can lead to strong polarization dependence, right? So, in the case of 2D photonic crystal band diagram, we have seen that you know for different polarization the bands look different. So, the band curves basically vary significantly for the both polar orthogonal polarizations. So, you can actually use photonic crystal as polarization sensitive filters. The simplest method for creating such a filter involves utilizing the photonic band gap of one particular polarization to achieve a reflection type. So, if it is having a band gap for one particular polarization, so for the same wavelength if the polarization is along say T and you have a T E band gap at that particular wavelength, T will not be able, able to enter the crystal, it will be simply reflected. So, you can actually make reflection type filter. A 2D photonic crystal built with multi layers on a corrugated substrate has been developed as a vertical input type filter and uh, they have demonstrated the performance typically you know 
less than 0 0.5 dB transmission loss and minus 50 dB extinction ratio which is which are very good meeting the pr practical application standards. So, you can actually visit this particular reference for further details of polarization uh, filter device that has been designed using photonic crystals. Okay? So, uh, the discussions are kindly focused on you know production cost due to the filters readiness for practical usage. Next, we move on to some discussion about you know sensing applications of 2D and 3D photonic crystals. So, we have seen that this particular band diagram couple of times and we understood that that this region is mainly used for you know super prism and then amorous uh, dispersion something like transmission type devices the band gap can be used for you uh, know reflection type devices something like um, lasers and uh, waveguides and this can actually give some birefringence kind of effect because different polarization has got different properties. So, using all these things, you can always think of photonic crystal based sensors, okay, which are useful for detection of analytes and parameters, physical sensors for temperature, humidity, stress, chemical sensors for organic solvents and their vapors, pH heavy metal ions and you can also make biosensors for enzymes like nucleic acid, antibodies and other things. So, this is the whole uh, you know spectrum starting from humidity, temperature, strain, you know different kind of solvents, pH, metal ions all these things can be you know uh, designed based on photonic crystal filter. So, at the core you can see is say 2D photonic crystal or 3D photonic crystal that helps you in the sensing application and these are the construction methods or fabrication steps mentioned here. So, what is important? The sensitivity in uh, 2D photonic crystal sensors is important because it is calculated based on the interaction between the light and the surrounding matter. So, specifically measuring the smallest change in the resonant wavelength relative to the changes in the environment you know or you can say ambient refractive index. So, what is changing your resonance wavelength because of a change in the refractive index. So, the change has a unit of you know nanometer per RIU which is refractive index unit. So, selectivity is the sensor's ability to accurately identify target analytes within a simple uh, that contain a variety of other substances as well. Okay? So, that way your sensor will only react to the particular uh, specific sample that it is supposed to work and that is how it will become an effective by sensor. It should not give you false reading by interacting with other similar kind of species. And stability is the consistency in the performance okay, in the presence of environmental interference on and stability will affect the accuracy of the measurements. So, you want a stable sensor, right? you do not want the, uh, you know, the sensor to give you different readings based on the uh, quick change in the environment. So, that is how you think of a stable sensor. Then other parameter is limit of detection, it is a crucial metric used to compare different you know optical biosensors defined as the smallest refractive index change needed to produce a detectable change in the sensors output signal. So, that is the limit of detection. So, sensitivity formula for optical biosensors can be represented as S equals delta lambda by delta n. So, delta n is basically the change in the ambient refractive index and delta n will be the corresponding change in the resonance wavelength. So, photonic crystal sensors and you know metal insulator metal based plasmonic waveguide sensors these are extensively used for refractive index sensing. Photonic crystal offers you know minimal preparation and high sensitivity while uh, metal in insulator metal based sensors are compact and they also have you know high sensitivity due to 
surface plus one pollutants. Okay, that's a different effect. And I have got a course on this uh, NPTEL MOOC that is uh, nanophotonics, plasmonics, and uh, metamaterials. There, all these uh, surface plus one pollutants have been discussed. Now, what are the challenges and advances in fabrication? These photonic crystal sensors are easier to fabricate on silicon on insulator platform with CMOS convert compatible processes. Whereas, if you think of metal insulator, metal kind of uh, sensors, they have steep challenges because of their complex thin metal layer. You can also think of different gas sensors based on photonic crystals to detect, you know, mid infrared gases, something like CO2 methane, carbon monoxide with sensitivities of the order of 510 nanometer per RIU in air slot cavities okay, to 13, um, you know, 1300 nanometer per RIU in SPR nano cavity arrays, okay, surface plasma resonance nano cavity arrays. So, what is clearly seen here is that it is more sensitive, the surface plasma ones are more sensitive, but then Fabricating uh, this kind of sensors, photonic crystal sensors are much easier because they can use, you can use silicon uh, or you can say CMOS compatible processes. Okay. So, additional designs include sensors with sensitivities of the order of, you know, 748 nanometer per RIU using guided mode resonance or 1550 nanometer per RIU for Febri-Pero you know fiber optic fabric pair cavity resonance and different other uh, resonance features people are also exploring. So, I will show you briefly how a um, photonic crystal based sensor would look like. So, here the figure shows you you know the details of few uh, refractive index sensors based on photonic crystals which have been reported in recent years. Okay, and here you can see it is a prism based structure okay, and uh, it is having this is the laser incident light and this is the reflected light. You have some kind of water containing antigen, okay, there is a glass side and then you have this prism which is basically BK7 okay. and in between you have this uh, metal which is gold for SPR. Okay, or you can actually uh, use this one, which is a 1D photonic crystal for similar kind of effect. Okay, so it is made of uh, graphene, MOS2, and other things. Okay, so the base is basically um, PMMA or silicon, on top of which you can have this uh, 2D kind of materials sandwiched or alternating layers. So you can think of uh, PMMA, MOS2, PMMA, graphene, something like that, and a periodic array. So, this kind of sensors, okay. So, this is basically another sensor which is uh, surface plasma resonance and uh, photonic crystal fiber based uh, biosensor, okay. And um, here, the outermost uh, layer of the air hole is basically filled with this blue blue circles that you are seeing. These are basically filled with uh, the aqueous uh, form of the biological factor that is that you are going to um, sense. The inside ones are basically air holes. Okay. So, this one shows the electric field distribution of the seventh order SPP mode and also the fundamental mode. Okay. So, this shows another example of photonic crystal biosensor uh, based on two waveguides and one ring. Okay. And this figure shows the vertical component of the electric field for different kind of uh, resonant peaks in this particular structure. Right. So, you can also use photonic crystal based sensors for stress detection. So, in that case, you need to have this photonic crystal, you know membranes based on the infiltration of photonic crystals with uh, PDMS which is a flexible substrate and you integrate them in a microfluidic system. So, um, the 
polystyrene can be um, used to fabricate an integrated optical pressure sensor sensing platform. So that way when you are basically um, stretching, so the periodicity changes, so the reflectance curve changes and when you release it, it actually goes back to the original state. So depending on the you know amount of stress being applied the periodicity changes and that will change the reflection pattern right so based on this feature you can actually see that the colors reflected colors are changing from the initial to the stretched state you can also have uh, photonic crystal based sensors for detection of uh, electric field so you can think of electric electrically responsive photonic crystal sensors which showed observable uh, optical characteristics of photonic crystals under the application of uh, electric field something like you know if you have 1600 uh, millivolt uh, for 10 seconds you can see this is the color it gives okay if you apply 2000 millivolt you get this color 26000 uh, 2600 millivolt you get a different color so how it is working it is basically you know you have uh, corresponding photonic crystal material which include photonic crystals based on liquid crystal molecules and metallic polymers right so with the different electric voltage that is being um, applied okay the response of the photonic crystal will slightly change and that is how the color that is getting reflected is also changing. So you can actually see that the electrical tuning was achieved by preparing some sort of electrochemical cell which consists of this uh, photonic crystals on ITO which works as the uh, in this one um, working electrode on both sides. You can also use photonic crystal based sensors for detection of glucose. So the recognition of photonic crystals with glucose molecules induced the increase of um, lattice spacing and that actually gives you redshift in the diffraction uh, wavelength from the photonic crystals. So you can see here that from 5 nanometer when it change uh, millimolar sorry this is the glucose concentration. So the diffraction peaks actually moves when you have larger um, concentration so all it does is that you know with higher concentration it adjusted it adjusts the lattice spacing and that is why you see a different diffraction color okay so when the photonic crystal appears green that is here the glucose concentration is basically in the normal range okay but whenever it comes here that is uh, it is showing you yellow color that means your glucose level has uh, reached a pathologically critical value okay and red means that you will have severe diabetes okay so three different colors you know green yellow red can be used for you know identifying you know uh, basic um, diabetes level in a person so these are different examples of uh, photonic crystal based sensors there are a lot of more applications um, I will try to cover some of the new applications also in one of the lectures which is uh, topological photonic insulator based uh, devices. So till then we uh, will stop here um, any questions regarding this lecture um, you can email to this particular email address mentioning MOOC and uh, photonic crystal on the subject line. Thank you.